Grand rising, grand rising, everybody. Shalom, shalom. Good morning. I uh, hope everybody is having a just beautiful, beautiful day already. It's already nine o'clock where I am. So wherever you are, whether it's day or night, I hope it is going great. So uh, without further ado, this is your sister Shia, the hood her historian, back with another sister for sister story time session. Still reading this big book, The Great Cosmic Mother: Rediscovering the Religion of the Earth, by Monica Stew and Barbara Moore. Uh, the next chapter we are reading is called "Life as a Mistake." Give me a moment to share my screen. Life as a mistake. It is typical of Westerners to view all Eastern religions, especially Buddhism, as nihilistic or life negating, while flattering ourselves that the Western Christian worldview and culture is positive and life affirming. In fact, both Christianity and Judaism, as well as Islam, are Eastern religions. They swept from the Near East along with the Indo-Aryan sun god beliefs and eventually stamped out the truly Western indigenous pagan religions of all Europe. And whether of East or West, all patriarchal religions are inherently nihilistic and facetic. They condemn the earth as the source of material life while exploiting her resources and creatures greedily for their own advantage and seek abstract spirit somewhere in the sky. They desire illumination or salvation, not within the ongoing life and death process, but by denying it, striving to escape it, or being redeemed from it through a male godhead who acts as Ursat's er mother. In its concepts of original sin and the need for salvation from fleshly life, and in its strange elitist belief that only one man has ever been of divine birth, Christianity is perhaps the most nihilistic religion yet to appear on earth. Certainly its impact on European culture throughout the years of the church's domination was almost entirely ne necro necrophilic, necrophilic and destructive. In the house of the Lord, ruled by the Christian hierarchy, man came not to live but to prepare for death. Life was corruption and evil. Life was to be lived merely as an exp expiation for being born. Death was the only hope of salvation from bodily existence. Beyond death lay the hereafter, unspoiled by suffering and sin, unlimited by time, space, and flesh, pure moment of wretchedness and pain on the threshold of angels. The more such doctrine was preached, the more accurate it became. What 4,000 years of increasing patriarchy had made of human life on earth was indeed hell. Christian Europe, in the span of its glory, was the fluorescence of hell. Much of the Western world's secular ripoff of the earth's people and natural resources has been inspired and justified by this Christian religious attitude that earthly life is debased and unreal anyway, and earth exists merely to be used with appropriate contempt by spiritually ambitious men. In fact, throughout the European Middle Ages, the world was pictured literally as the devil's excrement. Christian paintings and drawings of the time show cities, fields, animals, humans, trees, dogs, babies, flowers, all falling like masses of shit from the ass of Satan who squats above us all grinning. 
it's interesting in this context that Martin Luther had his great Protestant vision while sitting, as he tells us in his own words on the privy. The matriarchal attitude to bio to biology and sexuality, positive celebration and ritual ecstasy was not acceptable to the Lord. If sex and human biology were good, then women were good. And ecstasy can only be initiated by women who are equal and free partners, daughters of the cosmic mother. But this utterly contradicts Yahweh's wrathful theology where women as the carriers of sexuality are the cause of the fall and original sin. Both Old Testament and Christian priests saw physical love as the arch enemy of the spirit. It was Antichrist, it was Satan, female snares lining their male path to the disembodied hereafter. Long before Frude, the cosmic serpent was reified into a bestial symbol of sexual love counseled that women were the tempters, unclean deceivers of the male soul. Young boys were trained to be constantly on guard, even in dreams against female wiles. Until the trumpet announced judgment day and the male spirit would be transported to a heaven in which women were safely unsexed. This training in sexual paranoia was all pervasive in Christendom. Without it, the Inquisition could never have happened. Eating of the paradise fruit of sexual consciousness is forbidden by Yahweh in the Bible. And this ordinance was carried out by the Christian priesthood in Europe. Original sin was intrinsically linked to orgasmic experience. Love to be made pious and useful had to be sanctioned by the Lord, blessed by a celibate male priest, and then it was to be practiced only for the purpose of procreation. Righteously, not ecstatically, men should use women for the Lord to be fruitful and multiply his followers. El Shaddai, God of the early Hebrews, was a relentless punisher of sexual deviation, and deviation was any sexual activity not directed toward making children. Non-reproductive sex was considered a capitulation to bestiality, a strange error for the original Hebrew pastoralist to make since they should have observed it was beast and beast only who copulate solely for purposes of reproduction. The error doubtless derived from the newly discovered divinity of human semen. He who wasted his semen was a murderer to be punished accordingly. Onan in Genesis 38, 8 through 10 is killed by Yahweh for coitus interruptus, spilling his seed on the ground to prevent conception. This is the origin of the term Onanism, meaning male masturbation, a crime punish punishable by death in the Old Testament. The command of the Hebrew tribal god against waste of male seed is the source of all Western laws against abortion, contraception, masturbation, homosexuality, oral sex, and so forth, none of which were considered sins or crimes in pagan Europe. From the Old Testament, the Christian priesthood inherited the idea that to waste semen, to use it non-reproductively was to waste the life seed of the divine father, Yahweh, diminishing his essence. It was also to use women as something other than seed ovens or breeding cows. Hindu religion is also obsessed with semen, seeing it as Atman, the cosmic seed. Above all, the woman was not to enjoy the sexual act. The husband's orgasm was allowable as he worked for the Lord. But to give woman pleasure was to give flesh its due, tantamount to working for the devil. If a woman enjoyed sex, she was corrupt. Further, she might seek it outside the patriarchal household. The man's property might pass to a child not his own. Most of all, the mutual ecstasy of both partners would be cosmic union with the goddess. They would then backslide into the ancient matriarchal religions and social ways. 
Patriarchal dogmas of fleshly sin and corruption are always threatened by the imminent fact of earthly ecstasy. So is patriarchal property, which is built up so painfully via the denial of ecstasy. Islam, which also derives from the Bible, has gone to terrible lengths to prevent female enjoyment of sex. Infibulation and clitoridectomy still practice in parts of Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Egypt, Iraq, Somaliland, Ethiopia, Togo, and probably other East African regions is practiced on seven to 12 year old girls to make sure they will not be interested in sex. In other East Africa, wait, in the most extreme form, infibulation still practiced in Sudan, the child's labia minora are sliced off, the clitoris cut out, and the vagina sewn up, leaving a straw for urination and the passage of menses. This prevents the girl from considering intercourse until her wedding night when she is sliced open to fit the size of her husband's penis. For childbirth, she is sliced open further and then re-sewn. Reasons given for this operation are hygiene, beauty, women's natural genitals are seen as very ugly, and prevention of prostitution. It is believed that girls who have not been purified in this way will go with many men, or they might experience sexual love with other women, especially when living intim intimately together in polygamous households. Protests against this female mutilation have been brought before United Nations agencies and repeatedly ta uh, tabled UN officials seeing it as a cultural custom with which they have no right to interfere. We can imagine that if thousands of young boys each year were being castrated in these countries, the UN might make a statement, but perhaps not. World diplomats, overwhelmingly male, continue to pretend that sexual politics has nothing to do with world politics. The Christian church combined Old Testament insistence of sex for procreation with the classic Greco-Indian ideal of sexual abstinence or homosexual misogyny. The result was a form of marriage involving the greatest possible restriction of sexual feeling. The doctrinal union of male spirit with female dumb matter seen as a legal union under God's will of two incompatible opposites was of course not a union at all, but a cultural and physical enslavement of one sex by the other. In patriarchy, concepts of self and property are linked, while ecstasis means standing outside oneself. And so there is a very deep repression of ecstasy in patriarchal society. Men fear leaving their social status as master or husband and returning as a son to the cosmic mother. Men fear the no mind, cosmic mind, center of orgasm, its similarity to death experience, ego loss, and to madness, lunacy, moon surrender. And so men, having divided mind from body, then manipulate the body or penis as an instrument of uninvolved experience. This mechanistic distancing debases sexuality in order to ward off the challenge of love. The deepest I thou among humans cannot exist under patriarchy, the almost death orgasmic experience where the ego surrenders its defenses and becomes one with the cosmic self because the God of patriarchy condemns and rejects such ecstasy in his creatures. Instead, the man maintains his self-enclosed, often self-righteous ego, while the woman is depersonalized into a flesh object. Further, women are defined as sexually passive and naturally masochistic. All of this for highly political reasons. Depersonalized sex allows the man to keep his ego, his property. And patriarchal conditioning ensures that ensures there is no strong and healthy woman there to challenge him in the name of a higher transcendence. If such a woman should appear, she is dismissed as evil. 
Beyond the wastelands of despair, suffering, and alienation are goddess realms of intense joy and illumination. But the war and morality god stands at the border and will not allow the male ego to cross over. In Christianity, the only love ecstasy allowed is beyond the body. One may love the pure disembodied spirit of God or of Christ. Spiritual orgasm is the only type allowed to the lovers of the Christian God, the ascetic male and female saints and martyrs. Indeed, saints and ascetics may experience genuine thrills of passion for this divinely abstract lover, but most Christians have lived lives of chronic guilt, unable to close the gap between heavenly love and bodily experience. Every attempt to escape from sexuality transforms itself into prurience. Nowhere has sex been so debased and pornography so profitable as in the realms of Christendom. The moment of life's origin, the moment of the fusion of the female and male energies in non-reproductive ecstasy, it is in treating this moment as a bestial convulsion that patriarchal religion reveals its utter separation from life. Matriarchal identification of sexuality with the sacred of body with spirit threatened the manipulative dualism of patriarchal rule. Sexuality had to be ideo ideologically debased while reproduction was encouraged. This was accomplished by acknowledging male lust while condemning female flesh. Fuck, then repent. To this day, Christian religious doctrine exists to punish us for a bestiality which it has itself created. A most unholy trinity dominates the patriarchal tradition, rape, genocide, and war. This trinity is an ideological machine grinding out incessant warfare, power politics, exploitation of everything exploitable as some kind of objective historical process. And God the Father, in doctrine and in function, legitimizes all earthy, earthly patriarchs, bosses, slave owners, global corporations, male-controlled institutions, and professions of church, state, university, law, medicine, military, which exist to capture and reify life process. This secular imperialist tradition has for its model the domination of female matter by male mind. It is piously rationalized by theological doctrine and exploited endlessly by business and political interests. Its existence requires the sexual and intellectual destruction of women and any life form, humans, animals, plants, jungles, mountains, seas, seen as female, corrupt dumb matter may also be blasted, bulldozed, exploited, or otherwise improved by the all-conquering male mind with the blessings of all male priesthoods. Women in the Judeo-Christian, Islamic, Buddhist, Hindu, Confucian traditions are seen as some kind of functional mistake. Nature is a mistake, life is a mistake, and the male mind was born to correct it. Every woman should be overwhelmed with shame at the very thought that she is a woman, said St. Clement. To be fully developed as a human being is to be born a male, said Thomas of Aquinas. Aquinas believed the female sex was produced by a defect in nature's active force or even by a wind shift, such as that of the south wind, which is moist. The Orthodox Jewish man thanked his God every morning that he wasn't born a woman. If the world could be rid of woman, we should not be without God in our intercourse, said Cato of Utica. Among all savage beasts, none is found so harmful as woman, said St. John Chrysostom. What a misfortune to be a woman, and yet the worst misfortune is not to understand what a misfortune is, said Sorin Kierkegaard. The civil death of married women became fundamental law in Christian Europe, whereas in pagan codes, such as the Irish 
Shankas Moore, a married woman retained both property and civil rights. Under Judeo-Christian law, her original sin was punished by total civil and personal disenfranchisement. The Ecumenical Council at Macon in 900 decided with only a one vote margin that women had souls. Our souls were voted to us by some radical bishops of the Celtic church. In still later times, even this faint concession would still seem heretical. To the Christian fathers of the witch hunting centuries, if there was such a thing as a female soul, it existed entirely as a tool of the devil. The 500 years of European Inquisition were a systematic and intensive punishment of this female soul. To understand how such a grotesque phenomenon can happen, we need a brief overview of the development of the European mind, body, heart, and soul under the Christian religion. The best analytical survey of this time is provided by Michel Foucault in two works, madness and civilization and discipline and punish and punish the birth of the prison though not a feminist per se Foucault is a superb analyst of how the body its rhythms and energies became the subject slash object of the western machinery of total domination rome was the world's first imperial power and europe was the first colony the patriarchal machine set in place by Roman conquest and well oiled by Christian ideology ruled Europe by a threefold subjugation of mind, spirit and body. It took the raw resources of land, existing cultural customs and inventions, human energy and labor capacity, including female reproductive capacities, and ran these through the intellectual, religious and social processing gears of state control, wealth-based patrifocal class systems, and ontological theories of quote-unquote earthly evil meant to rationalize the very new and man-made evil of imperial domination. Rome could not control Europe forever by armed force. It had to control European mind and spirit to condition the pagan people to exploit and police themselves. Christianity was the tool of this conditioning. Generation upon generation of Europeans underwent what amounted to political brainwashing or the first colonial conditioning process. People were told from childhood that they were born evil, born in sin, and that life was meant to be full of suffering. They deserved luxury and in domination over the wretched many. They deserved this suffering as punishment for their human corruption. The elite few who did not seem to be suffering much but lived in luxury and in domination over the wretched many were said to be placed in domination by God and their rule was not to be questioned. Those who rebelled against earthly injustice and inequity were rebelling against God's will for man and would be punished both on earth and forever after in hell. Those who submitted meekly to all wretchedness, injustice, and misfortune, and did not rebel or seriously question their misery, would also be punished on earth with long suffering, but after death, they would get theirs in heaven. What such Christian indoctrination amounted to was a fiendishly effective training program for voluntary self-repression. It was designed to keep the natives busy on their knees, weeping buckets of blood, while the elite few carried off all the marbles. How did European people endure for hundreds of years living inside a system which ground them up like daily hamburger in a sin, guilt, and punishment machine? So long as the bulk of the European population lived on the land under the feudal system, the combined church court power was by necessity loosely exercised. With the development of centralized wealth and growth of urban centers under royal and clerical domination, more people were pulled into the cities where control over populations was maximized. This was the origin of the European state. 
the collusion of court power and church power forming the control center over the lives of the people. Although our history books highlight the power struggles between the religious and ruling elites of Europe in everyday life and most of the time they colluded as one spiritual secular power to keep the masses of people subjugated. The church dogmatically upheld the court state by fulminating against all political rebellion labeling quote-unquote troublemakers, including labor organizations, as heretical and satanic, and in general throwing God's weight on the side of submissive loyalty to the crown and against the demonic revolt. The state then scratched the church's back by using civil law and police power to uphold one religion and punishing anyone who spoke otherwise as a heretic or blasphemer. Throughout the formation of the European nation states, religious definitions systematically became legal categories. For example, a French edict of 1347 published by the state stipulated punishment for anyone who criticized or questioned the church, spoke against clerics in any way or used God's name in vain. Such blasphemers were to be locked into the public pillory every day from the hour of prime to that of their debts. And mud and other refuse, though no stone or anything injurious could be thrown at their faces, the second time in case of relapse, it is our will that he be put in the pillory on a solemn market day and that his upper lip be split so that the teeth appear. So much for blasphemers as the centralized church state drained away more wealth from the land and into the city environments and more wealth was wasted via the luxury living of the court and church elites and endless war one way, one way to absorb and divert the interest rate revolutionary energy of a suppressed population is by using it up in interstate conflicts. There was, of course, more poverty. Poverty among large crowded city populations was disruptive of the public tranquility with crime, prostitution, and disease rampant. So for the first time in history, the poverty problem was solved in Europe by blaming poverty on the poor. The secular and religious powers enforced this blame by declaring the poor sinful and insane and locking them up in hospitals, which were in fact prisons. This was the origin of the mental, mental institution, as Foucault describes it in Madness and Civilization. From the pulpit, there were moral denunciations of the poor, declaring them all to be unbaptized, living in sin and adultery, spreading demonism in their squalor and so forth, all to stigmatize the victims of the economic system for the problems of the system. Rounded up and thrown into places like the Hopital General, poor were removed from the city streets and also subjected to punishment for their economic conditions. Directors of the hospitals had total control over the inmates with stakes, irons, prisons, and dungeons at their disposal for the task of teaching morality to the indigent. The indigent. As Foucault points out, under imperialist class labor exploitation and Christian doctrines of innate human corruption, the whole idea of work had changed. Work was man's just punishment for being born sinful. Daily work was no longer seen as seasonal cyclic ritual participation in the life of earth because it was no longer that or as sheer productiveness of wealth, but as a moral exercise or expiation of moral mortal guilt. Since the fall, man had accepted labor as a penance for its power to work redemption. It was not a law of nature which forced men to work, but the effect of a curse. At least this is how the religious and courtly elites interpreted human work for such a definition worked to their advantage. People had to bend their backs in endless unrewarding labor, not to provide the few in power with, with unearned luxury and idleness, but to pay back their debt of guilt to God. Therefore, the poor 
seen as refusing to work were also refusing to be moral, refusing to be righteous, refusing to pay their debt of sin to God. This concept of human labor has ruled the rest the Western world for centuries. The religious ideology of work as divine punishment adjusts people's minds to accept the idea of work as an exploitation of one's life energies. The definition of the female body and female energy under patriarchal systems corresponds to the definition of the body slash energy of the poor and workers under capitalist economics. The bodily capacities and energies of some people are exploited, used as tools by others. And this is the development of all true classes, which can be simply categorized as the users and the used. The cult writes that the body's constitution as a labor power is possible only if it is caught up in a system of subjection in which need is also a political instrument meticulously prepared, calculated, and used. The body becomes a useful force only if it is both a productive body and a subjected body. Thus, the political use of the body, the female body or the body of the working class. The body cannot be used or exploited unless it is both oppressed and still functioning. This useful tool conditioning of females and workers is achieved by repressing the body's vital sexual energy, forcing it to sub sublimate in piety and drudgery. And this conditioning, as Wright clearly saw, is always achieved through religion and religious indoctrina indoctrination because, in fact, the spiritual and sexual energies are always subliminally linked. The church state ruling elite needs obedient workers to keep the economic and military organizations which service its power running. It also needs obedient or at least powerless female bodies to mass produce the workers, the armies, the police, and so forth. The cult again writes a population will be precious in proportion to its numbers since it will afford industry a cheap labor force, which by lowering the cost price will permit a development of products and commerce. By doctrinally controlling the reproductive processes of women, forbidding contraception and abortion, making the multiplying of bodies an act by which the male simultaneously serves his God while subjugating his woman, etc., the church upholds and furthers the state's power and its busyness by assuring a continuous, large, and exploitable population, guaranteeing one overspill of numbers to make armies or cannon fodder to a cheap labor force which is divided against itself via endemic competition of its numbers and three a disorganized and malnourished mass which is more vulnerable to political manipulation from the top Another means of controlling large numbers to their detriment is the invention of madness and its institutional punishment. Among all ancient pagan and shamanic people, madness is a spiritual category. Exotic behavior, schizophrenia, or hallucinations can mark a person destined for seership or shamanic psychic powers. Such people are treated as Ronald Lang has counseled, has counseled us to treat the schizophrenic experience, make the person as comfortable and safe as possible, and then allow them to go through their inner journey to the end. Consequently, primal societies do not have quote unquote unabsorbable crazy people who must be locked up to prevent harm to themselves or others. Such people are a relatively recent invention of Western societies. Christian culture has strong taboos against the quote unquote crazy behavior. Its own repressions have created, especially it telescopes sin into madness in its horrified treatment of perfectly natural behavior, masturbation, sexual urges, mischievousness, and so forth. And the state wields strong taboos against nonconformity of any kind, 
seeing the lack of a will to conform socially as always a potential for political rebellion. As Thomas Zaz showed in the Manufacture of Madness, the category of madness in the Western world was created to officially stigmatize and control those recalc recalcitrant people who were in effect sinners and rebels. In Madness and Civilization, Foucault further shows that the definition of what is mad has evolved through Western societies in perfect tandem with their political and ideo ideological evolutions. In the early Middle Ages, the madness inside human beings was defined as the remains of natural bestiality as yet unsalvated by spirit. During the Inquisition, madness was the satanic process within the human soul, punishable as sin. With the age of reason that followed, that followed the age of witch burnings, madness was socially and therapeutically redefined as the instinctive rebel within against the external authority of the Burgess father. Changing interpretively as it did, however, in all cases, the fact of madness was the same. It was the appearance of anti-patriarchy as animality, as wildness, as rebellion against legal and economic structures, as rebellion against religious assertion of male authority as the norm. Madness, as defined in Western Christian state societies, has always been a throwback to paganism, to nature, and to the rule of women or to what was remembered as the ambience of female nature and culture in the, patri in the pre patriarchal, pre Christian world, or madness is a political definition and a political state of being, as an atavistic throwback it refers to actual historical and prehistorical conditions before the dominance of the patriarchal church state over the psych so we have a religious economic political system which creates poverty and then legally punishes the poor for being poor which forbids females all control over their reproductive processes because its power depends on state church control of these processes. And finally, a system which is legally empowered to define and punish as mad, as insane, anyone who is foolish or brave enough to rebel against such a system or who simply breaks down into understand understandable lunacy under the insane oppression of such a system. Further, you have large numbers of human laborers subjected to a religiously derived idea of work as punishment as a day after day after day grinding and straightening of the born sinner into moral submission to the ruling machinery. And when the very long day's work was over, the masses of people go home. To what? To a personal life that has introjected a rigid repression of sexual ecstasy, of emotional epiphany or mental joy, a repression of all holistic vitality by the will of God and order of the king. This was the milieu of Europe even before the eruption of the Inquisition, the milieu of hell, a world in which public torture and executions and the dance of death were major popular entertainments, a world in which every town center exhibited a pillory, an execution block, assorted chains, whips, and other chronically inhabited instruments of individual individual straightening by the combined powers of church and court over all of which loomed the ubiquitous image of the devil squatting and defecating the entire world as immortality and filth from his cosmic anus from such a milieu 500 years of inquisition was inevitably born if life is such an error and what else would such a milieu feel like then it must be corrected 
if life is nothing but sin and what else could such a world be then it must be punished the church court machine defined human life as sin error and madness and then empowered itself as the divinely appointed appropriate apparatus for the correction cure and punishment of human life as Picault puts it in historically chilling words, the law of nations will no longer countenance the disorder of hearts. The witch hunts. If life is inherently evil, the church fathers needed someone to blame. And who is better to blame than woman who creates life from her own body? Living women also can be publicly punished as the iconic and illusory devil can never be. The myth of feminine evil, which, was dom which has dominated the Western world for over 2,000 years, led logically and directly to the religiously targeted murder of women as witches during the Great Inquisition of Europe. Until recently, the number of deaths from the Inquisition was euphemistically underestimated as a way of denying about 500 years of systematic persecution and slaughter by the Holy Christian Church. Now, perhaps, deaths are overestimated. We don't know. The estimates range from 1 million to 9 million people burned as witches between the 15th and 18th centuries. Between 1200 and 1484, people were officially killed as heretics. One number is certain of people punished for quote unquote witchcraft in Europe. 80% of those accused, tortured, and burnt were women. Town records from Germany and France reveal that whole villages were emptied of their female populations during the peak of the fiery of the fire frenzy, including very young girls and very elderly women. Travelers of the time reported countrysides hideously littered with stakes and pyres. Large numbers of homosexual men were also tortured and burnt at the stake. In fact, this is the origin of the term faggot to denote a male homosexual. Homosexual men were bound together at the foot of which pyres their bodies used as faggots to kindle the flames. In Europe at first, Christianity was a religion of the elite. It was an affection, uh, affectation, affectation, what? Affect to affectation whatever of feudal lords and later kings who made latin the official court as well as church language and who kept christian priests around as house clerics the large masses of people remained as they were pagan or peasants on the land practicing the ancient agricultural goddess rites unexpectedly for the Roman church, however, its three centuries of crusades to the Holy Lands had an ideological side effect. Returning feudal lords brought back exotic religious and lifestyle ideas, including the tantric sexual arts from the lands of the infidels or Islam with strong Moorish pagan undertones. The European elite nominally Christian especially those in the most civilized parts of Europe, which were Southern France, the wealthy cities of Central France, Italy, Belgium, and the Rhinelands were abandoning the fad of Christianity for more sensual and joyful spiritual amusements, including communal sex and bisexuality, not to mention Goliard and Trevor, Trobadar poetry and romantic lute music, lute from Arabic, allude the wood which was often composed and sung by wandering ex-monks in celebration of wine women and song their lyrics often mocked the church by turning hymns to the virgin into erotic songs to venus and portrayed christian clerics as drunken bums
The Roman Catholic Church was uneasy in Europe at this time, being constantly accused of priestly corruption, luxuriousness, and political religious chicanery. Europeans were backsliding into their indigenous paganism. Gnostic beliefs were circulating sub rosa and communities of medieval hippies were springing up everywhere. The threatened church could not tolerate the mass apostasy of its rich southern feudal elites. Engaging in shady political deals with some northern feudal lords, it arranged for the massacres of the Knights Templar and other sexual mystical communes of southern France. Thus, circa 1200 was the Inquisition invented. The church claimed it was punishing heretics. In fact, in these first slaughters of the playful and poetic Southern French aristocracy, the Roman church was declaring its political intention to stay in power in Europe by any means necessary, including the murder of anyone who questions its power or simply adopted a lifestyle of which it did not politically approve. Originally, the church had no punishment for witchcraft. In fact, it was considered heresy to believe in the possibility of bewitchment. People were simply condemned for the delusions of flying, enchantment, and the like. But in the mid-15th century, Roman Catholic-dominated Europe was in hideous turmoil once again. It had undergone the Black Plague, the hundreds the Hundred Years' War, and so many other physical manifestations of its spiritual morbidity, morbidity under Christianity. Nations were beginning to mark borders and gather secular power under kings vis-a-vis -vis the universal power of the Roman Pope and his archbishops throughout Europe. The church had already established a pattern of accumulating and tightening its secular power by the way of religious purges, heretic hunting. By this means, it terrorized and eliminated its political ideological enemies and at the same time diverted or co-opted the seething sexual revolutionary energies of the masses of people. In 1484, therefore, Pope Innocent VIII pronounced a papal bull against the now suddenly discovered crime of witchcraft. He denounced witchcraft as an organized conspiracy of the devil's army against the peace and common order of the Holy Christian Empire, a peace and common order which people living under that empire had rarely experienced. And thus the war against women was officially launched by the Christian papacy as a diversionary tactic to keep itself in power through the strategy of sheer terror. Two years later in 1486, two Dominican monks, Heinrich Kramer and Jacob Springer, published a book called Malleus Maleficarum, Hexenhammer, the Hammer of Witches. This book, in which femina is derived from Latin, fe minus, lacking in faith, was the official handbook of the witch hunters who found in it priestly and psychological justification for their already religiously aggravated hatred and fear of women. It became the indispensable authority for the Inquisition during the next 300 years of mass terror and persecution throughout Europe. The Hammer stated that human females were, by nature, agents and tools of the devil, and it gave explicit, explicit instructions for recognizing signs of devil possession any wart, mole, or freckle, or other skin blemish was a sign that a woman had been kissed by Satan and was evidence enough to send her to the stake. Behavior also was stigmatic, the way a woman or young girl dressed, the way she walked or talked, her hairstyle, the way she moved her eyes, any suspicions or envy that she might arouse in neighbors, any uniqueness, creativity, authority, or stubbornness of mind she might display for any reason whatsoever, all, all was the signature of the devil in her flesh. For wasn't woman born 
in God's own words, to entertain Satan in her private parts and thus to endanger the souls of men. In Kramer's and Spranger's professional opinions, only the rarest of females and dead ones were proof against demonic seduction and inhabitation. Thus was tumultuous Europe given a reason for all its woes, Shershes la femme, and burn her. The malleus maleficarum inflamed the paranoia and hatred of male mind against female flesh and mental autonomy, and in the hands of the local priest, preacher, and judge sanctified the arrest, torture, and burning of any woman who was denounced. Millions of European women, among them the best and bravest minds of their day, for these were days of cowards and fools, the only type who survived in large numbers. The Christian witch burners were obsessed with sex, and the witch hammer constantly equates the, dev the devil with sexual activity. The power of the devil lies in the privy parts of men. It was also believed that all material life sprang from semen. Bodily speaking, sons and less valued daughters were owned by the father as much a part of the master's property as were servants and animals. Women with their devil-inspired power over sex were thus a major threat to a man's possessions, not only his soul, but all other worldly goods. Witches were accused of instigating extramarital sex, of inhibiting potency, hindering conception, slaying infants in the womb, all threats to patrilineal property inheritance. For every impotent man, a woman could be tortured and burned. Within the grim inquisition torture chambers, also prurience and piety were two joined hands. Women were raped and sexually abused by their official torturers as they lay chained to dungeon walls or spread out naked on the racks, all with the blessings of the priests who, were read who readily rationalized these activities as devil exorcism. The torture and were blessed by the priest before they were used. Kramer and Spranger, the two Dominican monks who wrote the hammer, were eventually chastised by the Catholic Church for their habit of going around to German villages and fabricating evidence of witchery. For example, Kramer paid an old drunk woman to hide in ovens and make weird noises, thus proving to her neighbors that the woman of the house was possessed. But of course, this chastisement was not severe. Even if evidence against the woman was fabricated, she probably was a witch or could be one someday. An ounce of prevention and so many women had already been burned or would be burned, there was no way to stop it. Originally plotted and engineered by the Catholic Church, the European witch burnings took on the atmosphere of a natural holocaust. Spiritual fires set by God burning out the evil plagues of the human soul. Witchcraft was unavoidably political. It was what remained of the native pagan European religion kept alive through 1,000 years of Roman church imperialism and imported Christian ideology. Witchcraft was the religion of the country people and served as the tribal core around which potential and actual revolt could be mounted. King Richard I was a witch. He dreamed of leading a pagan uprising against European Christian courts and churches, but the Crusades drained off resources and energy from his plans. Too many feudal lords chose to go off to fight in the Palestinian Holy Lands rather than remain at home fighting for their own pagan lands, the holy soil of the old religion. Witchcraft was why the church allowed Joan of Arc to be burned. She could not only lead France against its secular enemies, she might also lead the people against the oppressive dominance of the French church crown. For Jean de, uh, Jean de Arc was a native European witch resonating to the needs and dreams of the peasantry. In the wrestling match for power, between the Catholic Church and the New Reformation Protestant sects, witches were made scapegoats by both sides. 
in German Catholic villages and towns, priests directed the people to burn Protestants and witches. In German Protestant towns and villages, preachers called for the burning of Catholics and witches. In these endless sectarian games, which make up so much of European history, people's conditioned biophobias, the endless paranoias and hatreds produced by dogmatic repression were systematically directed by the Christian church against witches, women, and other scapegoats, and thus diverted from rebellion against what was truly oppressing them. The unearned wealth, power, and corruption of the Christian church itself. Martin Luther has been ballyhooed as a freedom-loving reformer. In fact, he was the same tyrant in stubbornly unpriestly garb. All the reformist men were fanatic haters of witchcraft, shouted Luther. I would have no compassion on the witches. I would burn them all. Martin Luther raged against the peasant rebellions that were breaking out everywhere because the peasants were pagans. Luther believed the revolts were instigated and led by witches and Satan. He saw clearly that these indigenous uprisings threatened the imperialist cr Christian church crown control of Europe, which he fully supported. He called for the merciless slaughter of all the rebellious peasants in God's name. Five centuries of Holy Inquisition, especially the intensive 300 years of witch hunts following the papal bull of 1484, were a means of increasing the real wealth as well as power of the Christian church. The property of every person burned passed into the church's possession lands, goods, money, and it wasn't just the poor who were burned. On the contrary, the Inquisition was finally ended because more and more whole towns were being ravaged and depopulated with leading citizens arrested and brought to the stake. Thousands upon thousands of acres of land, homes, farms, and businesses, personal wealth and goods all were stripped from the accused witch and absorbed into the church. Children of the condemned were forced to stand before the stakes, watching their parents burn. As they watched, they were whipped by the priest as punishment for being spawn of the devil. These children, orphaned and robbed of all inheritance except shame and grief, were sent to wander as beggars or imprisoned in Christian orphanages. We can wonder how many of us are descendants of these church disinherited orphans who numbered in the millions. This didn't all happen so long ago. Witches were still burned daily in 17th century Europe. The Inquisition gave itself license to use any means to force confessions out of the accused. Judicial torture, not allowed under native European law, was imported directly from old Roman law for the express purpose of extra extracting confessions from witches. The proving of double possession was cunning for the refusal to confess companionship with Satan was seen as a sure sign of guilt, while confession was heard as clear admission of guilt, though most confessions were extracted only by the most hideous torture. Both denial and confession were punished with death. In some trials, witches were bound hand and foot and thrown into deep ponds. If they drowned, they were pronounced innocent. If they managed to float, they were hauled out, pronounced guilty, and dragged to the stake. Professional men called prickers made a living going from town to town, sticking needles into women. Accused women were exposed naked from the waist down in the public square for this purpose. The prick was a tool with a hollow shaft, allowing the pricker to appear to stick a woman's flesh. If she didn't bleed from the wound, she was a witch. Of course, with his secret retractable needle, the pricker could guarantee that many women would, did not bleed. And for each witch he thus exposed to death, he was paid money by the local church and town government. 
Many male professionals profited from the witch trials and executions. Local judges, bailiffs, guards, and doctors all got their cut, as well as the torturer and scaffold maker. In, such, in some cases, the accused witch was actually charged for the cost of searching her or his house, transportation to the trial, the cost of the paper used to record the trial, all food eaten during imprisonment, the cost of the wood consumed during the burning, and the travel expenses for two judges to escort the burnt body to a gravesite. The witch trial trans transcripts are hideous but sobering reading. From such transcripts and for freedom, gleaned the story of Frau Peller. It seems a notable German judge, Franz Berman, lusted after Frau Peller's sister. The sister refused to sleep with him in retaliation. Frau Peller was arrested. She was arrested in the morning and by 2 p.m. she was tortured. She was exorcised, shaved, searched, and raped by the torturer's assistant and further tortured. To silence her cries, Judge Berman himself stuffed a dirty handkerchief into her mouth. After being tortured into naming her accomplices in witchcraft, Fra Peller was indeed convicted and burned alive in a hut of dry straw. Her husband, a court assessor, protested her trial and was thrown out of the courtroom. He died a few months later. Judge Bourbon was a busy man in two visits to three small German villages near Bonn in 1631 and in 1636. He managed to burn alive 150 people from a total of 300 households. Some of the simpler torture instruments were used, used were eye gougers, branding irons, metal forehead tourniquets, and spine rollers with sharp metal protrusions. Protrusions. There were the usual thumb screws and leg vises, stocks with iron spikes, and boards with sharp pegs on which people were forced to kneel for hours. One of the more exotic instruments was called the pear. It was roughly the size and shape of a pear, constructed in two metallic halves, each attached to a handle and hinged to open, like scissors or forceps. The pear was heated to red hot, then inserted in the prisoner's mouth, anus, and or vagina, and spread open as far as it would go. One renowned trial judge in France, Jane Bowden, boasted of torturing very young children and invalids. A lawyer, philosopher, and demonologist considered one of the best minds of his generation. Bowden specialized in cautery and hot irons, and then cutting out the putrefied flesh. Feathers were dipped in burning sulfur and clamped in armpits and groins. People were giving scalding baths and water mixed with lime. Bodies were stretched on racks and ladders or suspended by the thumbs with weights and attached to the ankles. In the strapado, considered a mild torture, the arms were tied behind the back with a rope attached to a pulley. The body was hoisted up and weights were attached to the feet. In squassation, a more severe punishment, this trust body was suddenly allowed to drop several feet, then jerked up, then dropped again. The point frequently achieved was to separate all the joints in the body. Even after people had confessed, been sentenced, and were waiting to be burned, they could still be subjected to random torture. Hands, tongues, noses, and ears were cut off, and women's breasts were torn with red hot pincers. Girls as young as nine or ten were persuaded to uh, trowel such torture through such tortures to confess they had sexual relations with the devil. In the American colonies, where an estimated 300 people were killed as witches, some burnt, but most hung, torture was also used against young and old. In Salem, Massachusetts in 1692, two young boys were tied up from the neck and heels until blood dripped from their noses. Then they confessed, accusing their mother, who was hung. Some of these activities took place in dungeons.
to the private titillation of torturers, judges, and priests. Other tortures occurred in public with much pious fulmination, supposedly to edify, terrify, and entertain the general populace, and of course the design manufacturer and sale of torture devices was big business, especially in Germany, but also in France and Spain, where the Inquisition was at its worst and longest. All this hideous activity, we must remember, took place in the name of Christ and by the will of God and was said to be aimed solely at the discipline and salvation of the human soul. The Exodus 22, 18 injunction, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, was frequently quoted, though in 1584, an Englishman, Reginald Scott, pointed out that the Hebrew word for poisoner had been mistranslated as witch. But pagan witches, as specialists in herbal medicine and hallucinogens, were easy to slander as poisoners. In Old Testament Hebrew, as well as medieval European times, the words could have been used interchangeably. There are numerous biblical texts expressing Yahweh's hatred and condemnation of all people who could be generically defined as witches, diviners, pythons, conjurers, fortune tellers. We know that all Neolithic goddess worshiping peoples were identified by the Hebrew prophets and patriarchs as evil, idolatrous, and unclean, and Yahweh wanted them all dead. Christianity's remarkably ugly record of religious intolerance begins in the Old Testament where Yahweh's people are directed by him to murder anyone practicing a rival religion. The 500 years of European inquisition and witch burnings had their direct inspiration and sanctification from the Holy Bible. And there is no way to avoid this conclusion. The secular motives and secular gains of the witch hunts can be credited to the imperialism of the Roman Catholic Church, to the equally power-hungry fanaticism of the Protestant reformists, and to all the other European men who obtained advantage or sick thrills from the torture and destruction of the human body in general and women's bodies in particular. The Christian church used the Bible's divine mandate for religious murder, not only to survive the political turmoil of the Middle Ages, but to expand and secure one of the largest and most powerful secular institutions on earth, Western Christendom. We have been persuaded to believe by Christian apologists that the church only meant to execute the bad witches, people who cursed and poisoned their fellow beings. This is a lie. The Christian church during the Inquisition did make a distinction between the good witch and the bad witch, and it ordered that both kinds be destroyed. Theologians of the day wrote that, wrote that the good witch was a more horrible and detestable monster than the wicked one. The church claimed that the good witches were even, I'm sorry. Yeah, the church claimed that good witches were even more harmful to its authority than the, male the maleficent ones. Civil law did not call for punishment of the white witch or unbinding witch, as the helpful witches were called, but ecclesiastical law did. Why? Because the good witch more effectively persuaded her neighbors of the genuine power of her religion. She successfully undermined God's will that humans should suffer. Her cures worked. For a thousand years, the people had one healer and one only, the sorceress. Emperors and kings and popes and the richest barons had sundry doctors of Salerno or Moorish and Jewish physicians. But the main body of every state, the whole world, we may say, consulted no one but the saga, the wise woman. The priest realized this clearly where the danger lies that an enemy, a menacing rival, 
is to be feared in this high priestess of nature he pretends to despise. And the Dominican Springer, he of the hammer wrote, we should speak of the hearsay of the sorceresses, not of the sorcerers. The latter are of small account. Nature makes them sorceresses. A French writer under Louis the 13th wrote, for one sorcerer, 10,000 sorceresses. The sorceress, the town witch, was also and always the people's healer, the midwife, the skilled pharmacologist. The people needed her, women especially needed her. Christian authorities admitted that the good witch's help to the country people was of ancient tradition and good effect, but this was the cause for burning them. The white witch's power to cure sickness proved that she had a pact with the devil. The priests could not cure. They had only punitive dogmas, abstract words, empty gestures typical of rootless ritual. If the good witch could cure, clearly she possessed superior knowledge and power, a possibility the church could not allow. Instead, it officially sourced her power in evil. The white and the black witch were both guilty alike in compounding with the devil. Thus, with one stroke, the priestly hierarchies eliminated both their rivals for public influence and the living evidence that their own religion was a fraud. As the witch hammer spelled it out, any unexplained power or phenomenon was suspicious, sourced in evil, and 15th century Europe was a hotbed of unexplained phenomena. There were rationalists extant who scoffed at the notion of witchery, arguing that strange occurrences could be the result of a simple manipulation of hidden but natural powers, not necessarily demonic ones. But all power, however human or natural, threatened the total authority of the church fathers and the real powers of witches, powers of nature and the human psych, knowledge, customs, and techniques going back for millennia were the greatest threat of all, for these were precisely the traditions the patriarchy had broken with. The Malleus Maleficarum, called for the destruction of the ancient and secret knowledge of poisons or herbs and drugs, healing and hurtful, a tradition of lore which had been handed down from the remotest time. Healing and hurtful, it was not the witch's wickedness but her effectiveness that the church wanted to destroy. In patriarchal religion, only God has power. Power does not exist in nature, and it is not something he shares with his creatures. Dreams, faith, and energy must be strictly directed, directed and controlled by his church, his police force on earth, and no one may fly through the night with the moon or envision other worlds or commune with the earth and the stars or cure illness with herbs without being seen as the agent of the devil. The monks Kramer and Spranger prove that any form of knowledge which is not a direct revelation of God the Father is of the devil and only priest had direct revelation of God an ordinary mortal claiming such experience was clearly possessed by Satan. The people's ancient knowledge was, of its very nature, suspect and sinful. The miracles performed by Christian saints were given them by the grace of God, not by the power of nature. In Christianity, nature has neither grace nor power. If it appears to exhibit either, the appearance must be devilish. The saints' miracles were evidence of only anti-natural power belonging to those who deny nature and give themselves to the Father. The kind of power exhibited by the saint who stood before a crowd of peasants and slowly, one by one, plucked all the feathers out of the body of a wild bird, he then handed around... He then handed around the bloody tortured mass as, as evidence that nature could not save her creatures. Once God had willed their destruction at the hands of a holy man. Since we are born of God, what wonder 
then that the sons of God enjoy extraordinary powers. The daughters of the goddess, on the other hand, were burned alive by the millions for exhibiting and using their own extraordinary powers. And when we see that which knowledge was identical with agricultural knowledge with earth, moon, and star lore, then it is no wonder that the peasants' rebellions were tied in with the witch hunts. Neither shall ye use enchantment nor observe times. Leviticus 19.26 Idolatry is the first of all superstitions, divination is the second, and the observing of times and seasons the third, Malleus Maleficarum, part one, question two. Seemingly, demons are readier to appear when summoned by magicians under the influence of certain stars. They do this in order to deceive men, thus making them suppose that the stars have some divine power or actual divinity. And we know that in days of old, this veneration of the stars led to the vilest idolatry. Malice Maleficarum, part one, question six. The, there are three superstitions, necromancy, geomancy, and hydromancy. Malleus Maleficarum, part one, question two. Three superstitions, the study of death, earth, and water, plus the study of the stars. St. Augustine opposed cyclic theories of the moon, and Christian men could proclaim, as they did, the sun and moon were made for us, how am I to worship what are my servitors? Christianity was the abstract ideology of an urban-centered court hierarchic priesthood. Its organization was obsessed with political power only. It knew nothing about the land, the seasons, the crops, natural energies. If the peasants listened to the church, nothing would grow. These brilliant monks who wrote so contemptuously about superstition, let us remember, also believed that the earth was flat and at the center of the universe, and that the mother of the universe was a man who created the first female from Adam's rib. According to Cosmos, a 6th century Christian geographer, Jerusalem was at the center of the flat earth, which had been created about 4,000 BC by a Hebrew thunder god. To doubt such Christian superstitions during Inquisition, Inquisition days meant hearsay and could lead to one being burnt at the stake. We will never know what harm was done to the human psyche by these rabbit terrorisms that Christianity destroyed books, libraries, whole cultures and their records, monuments of ancient knowledge and wonderful art that it set the intellectual development of the human race back hundreds of thousands of years we already know. We can only begin to guess what it did to the natural poetic psyche of human beings, the dream process itself, ecstasy, divination, foretelling, entrancement, use of magic herbs, drugs, and shamanic yogic techniques, powers essential to the evolutionary health and balance of the human psyche were forbidden, punished, and driven into a guilt-ridden underground by Christian dogma. The witch hammer reinforced the Old Testament injunction that all dreamers must be stoned to death. A man or a woman in whom there is a pythonical or divining spirit or that is a wizard, let them die. They shall be stoned, Leviticus 20 and 27. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams and that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, Deuteronomy 13, 3 through 5. The Malleus Maleficarum proclaimed, those women are called pythons in whom the devil works extraordinary things. It is unlawful for any man to practice divination. And if he does, so his reward shall be death by the sword of the executioner. The Malleus 
and the church denounced witchcraft as a spiritual crime. It blasphemed and profaned the creator. Perhaps more crucial, the psychic powers tapped and activated by witches were defined as political crimes. Witchcraft is high treason against God's majesty. Because the state acted as police, prosecutor, judge, and executioner for the church's definition of such crime, high treason against God surely constituted a threat to its temporal power as well. Thought police and dream police are not 20th century at atheistic inventions. They are our inheritance from the European Inquisition, which in the joint name of God and the King initiated the most extreme active manipulation and politicize, bleh, politicization of the human mental processes ever known. According to Christianity, human beings may have only one dream, the dream of redemption through Christ from the sin of being born. The entire ancient relation between the cosmos and the human mind mediated by the dream process was thus interfered with and distorted by patriarchal dogma. The witches were accused of riding through the night with Diana, of practicing divination, of studying the stars and observing seasons, of having knowledge of plants for medicinal and visionary purposes. In other words, they were accused of dreaming dreams and using their own minds. They were accused and found guilty of communing with the powers of the universe and for knowing themselves to be one with that universe. Such knowledge with such communion is a major crime in any society where a biopic father God rules. To this day, we in the enlightened West are surrounded by laws forbidding use of natural drugs like peyote and mushrooms for pythonic purposes. North American Indians, like pagan people worldwide, were punished by their conquerors for practicing peyote rituals and shamanism. As substitutes, they were handed the white man's poisons, Christianity and alcohol. Alcohol and drugs became become addictions only in cultures where ritual drug use is forbidden. Christian missionaries fight peyote and mushroom use for political reasons. They want to be in total control of human visionary experience. They want to control the contents and directions of our dreams. And where missionaries fade away, modern psychotherapists come on strong, established mental health doctrine views, views all powerful messages and visions from the subconscious, the self as undesirable symptoms of mental disturbance. Too many of our modern visionaries have been inquisitioned by straitjackets, the normalizing drugs, electroshock therapy, and lobotomies. From the torturer of the Inquisition, breaking bodies on the rack in the name of saving souls, to the modern psychiatrist administering electroshock or sonic lobotomies for the purpose of adjusting the mind, there is, a, there is little difference. Both are cremators of the soul, the soul that dreams, both in the name of cure, are employed by a society that needs to adjust human beings to la vida sin suenos. The witch burnings didn't take place during the Dark Ages, as we commonly suppose. They occurred between the 15th and 18th centuries, precisely during and following the Renaissance, that glorious period when, as we are taught, men's minds were being freed from bleakness and superstition. While Michelangelo was sculpting and Shakespeare writing, witches were burning. The whole secular enlightenment, in fact, the male professions of doctor, lawyer, judge, artist, all rose from the ashes of the destroyed women's culture. Renaissance men were celebrating naked female beauty in their art while women's bodies were being tortured and burned by the hundreds of thousands all around them. New communication technology also contributed to the witch hunts. The printing press was established in 1450. The first major work printed was the Bible. 
Martin Luther was born in 1483. We know that the Protestant Reformation of the early 16th century was fueled in large part by the existence of the new mass printing technology. The Latin Bible used by the Catholic Church was an elitist handbook. Few possessed it. Fewer could read it. The reformists argued for the translation of the Bible into German into all the European vernaculars so that the people could read the word of God for themselves. This religious revolution was made possible by the new print technology. As the 16th century heated up, as we've said, witches were everywhere caught in the crossfire between the Catholic Church and the Protestant reformists. But there was another turn of the screw. In the 16th century, for the first time, people were able to read the Bible's misogyny in their own languages before they'd received only the Latin passages and the interpretations of priests. But now the full word of God was spread before their eyes and Yahweh's wrathful condemnation of female flesh as the unclean playing field of the devil was quite, quite clear. Because of their fundamentalist literalism in the following of Holy Writ, the misogyny of the reformists was often more extreme, if possible, than that of the Catholics. Further, the new popular press throve on the witch hunts, etched plates depicting pornographic scenes of witches romping with satanic figures and graphic etchings and woodcuts showing varieties of tortures, drownings and burnings of women were printed in large numbers and broadcast through every town, large and small. Some feminists might feel these popular press images were the snuff films and penthouse magazines of their day. They purported to be on the spot depictions of tortures and burnings with naked and half naked female bodies screaming and writhing in endless postures of agony surrounded by well-dressed male judges religious accusers prickers and other righteous gentlemen of the time there is no doubt that these mass printed images fueled a mass paranoia against women, against witches. They also marked the beginnings in the West of pornography as popular entertainment. It is historically chilling to consider that the new print medium before it ever served as a tool of mass education or enlightenment was used as a firebrand to ignite mass hysteria and murder. But this was the case. The new technology of the radio served the rising terrorist dictatorship of Adolf Hitler in the same way. And the use of the television medium by demagogic hell-raising preachers and politicians, especially in America, might give us a prison of forewarning. Jerry Mander, an analyst of modern electronic communications media, points out that certain media favor certain fundamentalist types of God and religious worldviews. Religions with charismatic leaders, single all-powerful God or individual God-like figures are simpler to handle on television because they have highly defined characteristics. Nature-based religions are dependent upon a gestalt of human feeling and perceptual exchanges with the planet and would lose their meaning on TV. Double projection and witch hunting are functional parts of patriarchy. They are essential tools of mass control via mass energy diversion. If life is born out of evil, as Christians believe, then devil paranoia is chronic to Christian life. If we look at Western Christian history through our pagan evolutionary glasses, we can see that demon projection and witch hunting have never really stopped. They are endemic to Western politics. One reason the Inquisition and witch burnings died down in Europe was that Christian European kings, governments, religious men, and male citizens had found new hunting grounds, new scapegoats. A round world had given them new worlds to conquer with new heathens to convert, use, and destroy. 
Europe emerged from the inquisition of its own peoples via the inquisition of the dark others across the oceans or imperialist colonialism. There were black Africans to be enslaved on their own continent or dragged in chains to the American colonies where there were also numerous indigenous tribes of pagan idolaters, the North, Central and South American Indians, all of whom could be defined as mere animals, bestial demons and spawn of the devil. Whatever it took to rationalize enslaving them, massacring them, ripping off and cannibalizing their lands, cultures and life energies. Whenever we read the history of Western colonial imperialism during the 15th and the 15th to 19th centuries, we should remember that the men, the political and religious institutions and worldviews conducting it were the same as those who conducted the Christian Inquisition and witch hunts for five solidly sadistic centuries. Christian men in the name of Christ enlarging their properties, their powers, and their pieties in the same bite, witch hunting and devil projecting in more or less subtle forms are classic patriarchal tools. They can be picked up and used anytime, anywhere to build the house of God, that exclusive clubhouse of ambitious men. In the past decade in America and throughout the world, there has been a resurgence of fundamentalist religious activity or at least an increased focus on it in the media. Fundamentalism in any Western religion, Christian, Judaic, Muslim, means a strict literalist interpretation of and obedience to the words of some ancient text considered divinely inspired coupled with a zealous desire to make the world correspond to these texts or God's word, God's law. In a mid 1970s poll taken by one of the popular presses, 50% of the Americans interviewed agreed with the statement that all the world's troubles are caused by the devil. And in 1980, Americans installed a president who in public statements seems to be stating his belief that half the world, the other half is composed of beings who intentionally will evil. With this upsurge of fundamentalist ontology has become increased media reports of satanic cults and sensationalized television dramas of such cults and related ritual killings in America. Undoubtedly, there are satanic cults in the United States composed of both silly and dangerous people, but it must be pointed out that there is no historic record of mass killings by Satanists anywhere at any time. The world record for mass killings is held by Christians. Hundreds of millions of human beings in the past 2000 years have been tortured and slaughtered in an infinite number of hideous ways in the name of Christ and by people who believed or who said they believed they were exterminating agents of the devil, Satan worshipers, dangerous idolaters. We have just talked about the first Holocaust 300 years of witch burning in Europe. In the second Holocaust of World War II, 5 million to 6 million Jews were exterminated along with millions of other quote unquote unclean subhumans, communists, feminists, gypsies, homosexuals, the physically and mentally handicapped in Germany, Austria, and France. Altogether, about 45 million people died in that war, including 22 million Russians and all the Japanese citizens who perished in the nuclear holocaust of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. World War II had several causes and secular triggers, but essentially it was one more religious war. Adolf Hitler was born and bred a German Catholic. In 1941, he stated to one of his generals, Gerhard Engel, I am now as before a Catholic and will always remain so. In Mein Kampf, Hitler repeatedly states his conviction that he is working for God and Christ. Therefore, I am convinced that I am acting as the agent of our creator. 
by fighting off the Jews, I am doing the Lord's work. At a Nazi Christmas celebration in 1926, Hitler proclaimed Christ was the greatest early fighter in the battle against the world enemy, the Jews. The work that Christ started but could not finish, I, Adolf Hitler, will conclude. Hitler's program was essentially a fundamentalist program. He was extremely moralistic, violently opposing adultery and any kind of sexual liberation for women or any roles for women outside of wife, mother and church volunteer. He opposed abortion, though this did not keep him from killing children and pregnant women or from allowing women's wombs to be packed with cement in laboratory experiments. And he opposed pornography, though this did not prevent him from creating the obscenities of Auschwitz of the Dasha. The point is that historically it has never been satanic cults or devil worshipers, even when such groups exist that have endangered the world on any large scale. The world has been endangered and ravaged in historic times and is endangered now overwhelmingly by quote unquote righteous, fundamentalist, moralistic people who insist they are working for God, quote unquote, for Christ, do doing the Lord's work, and who manage to get large numbers of people to agree with them, in particular armed men. The mechanism of all holy war is devil projection, the targeting of specific groups, heretics, witches, Jews, communists, feminists, homosexuals, subversives as demonic, satanic agents, and the inflammatory insistence that God wills the exorcism or extermination of these devils by his chosen, self-appointed holy men. Years or centuries of conflagration follow the historic damage in the West being done not by the devil, not by devil worshipers, but by Christians ruled by their fear and hatred of the devil. We do not know how many people have died recently in America at the hands of satanic cults. In the past decade, there have been dozens of killings by Christians of other human beings believed to be possessed by the devil. Tragically, with few exceptions, the victims have all been little children tortured and killed by their parents, relatives, or babysitters because these pitiful Bible-obsessed adults believe the children had the devil in them. Doubtless, the mid-1970s success of films like The Exorcist and The Omen, in which the devil always sensationally picks children to inhabit, is related to this sad phenomenon. It's true, though. In 1976, a Christian fundamentalist sect was involved in the beating death of a three-year-old boy whose parents were members of the sect. They were beating the devil out of the boy. In Philadelphia in 1979, a three-month-old baby was thrown out of a second-story window by its aunt because she said, the Lord told me to. In New York in 1980, a 21-month-old boy was exorcised by his mother while three brothers watched. The infant was scalded in boiling water and then seared to death in an oven. The mother explained to police that she had to get the devil out of her baby. In 1983, a two-and-a-half year old California girl was held down by her father on a hot floor heater until the devil left her and she died. In 1984 in Bangor, Maine, a man killed his girlfriend, girlfriend's four-year-old daughter by burning her in an electric oven. He claimed the child was Lucifer and he was performing an exorcism on her. In Austin, Texas in 1980, a 21-year-old male was sleeping with his head against his truck window one night when his best friend drove up, saw his head, and blew his brains out with a deer rifle. The man with the gun had just been discussing Satan with his female companion, and he told police he had seen the devil in his sleeping friend's head. In Hampton, Virginia in 1979, a mother cut off her own hand 
hand, the right hand of her five-year-old daughter, and the left hand of her seven-month-old daughter because she had been reading the Bible and thinking about John the Baptist getting beheaded. In a small Wisconsin town in February 1985, a man calling himself Elijah shot and killed a priest and two church parishioners. He claimed he was following God's will and punishing these men for allowing a girl to read scriptures during mass. In American Fork, Utah, in the winter of 1984, two brothers named Ron and Dan Lafferty entered by force the home of their sister-in-law, Brenda, the wife of a younger brother, Alan Lafferty. The two brothers were founders of the School of Prophets, a breakaway fundamentalist Mormon sect. A few years earlier, they had been excommunicated by the Mormon church for their behavior and beliefs, which included a return to polygamy as a holy duty. The School of Prophets, citing Bible texts as support, claimed that wives were property given to men by God and meant to obey without question all instructions from their husbands. A woman who resisted her husband's wishes in any matter was a fornicator and her children were in the eyes of God and Utah and the Utah prophets, children of fornication. Brenda Lafferty had supported the wives of these two brothers in divorce suits following the men's return to holy polygamy. Ron and Dan Lafferty had also received a revelation that called for six mighty ones to battle for the Lord against Lucifer. The School of Prophets was born in this revelation, composed of five Lafferty brothers, but the sixth, Alan, was discouraged by his wife from having anything to do with the self-appointed prophets. She believed they were Satanists. When the Lafferty brothers forced their way into Brenda's home while her husband was at work, they were acting according to another revelation. God had told them it was his will that these people be removed. Witnesses heard the men calling Brenda a bitch, slut, and liar. She fought back, kicked and screamed, and begged them not to harm her child who was in, his, in a crib. The two men stifled her with a pillow and tied a cord around her neck so that one brother could slit her throat. Then they held her back, held her head back to let the blood pour from her body as a proper biblical sacrifice. The murder knife was then handed to Dan Lefferty, who went to the crib where a 15 month old baby Erica was crying, mommy, mommy. Dan Lafferty slit the baby's throat, telling people later, it wasn't no problem. I felt the spirit. It was with me. During his trial, Dan Lafferty acted as his own lawyer, admitted the killings freely, and defended himself entirely on the basis that the murders had been commanded by God. The state has failed to prove that a crime has been committed. He told his jury, it could very well be fulfillment of revelation of God, not a crime, Lafferty further testified. Consistent with the scripture, we are told that there are going to be some frightful circumstances when the Lord's kingdom is built up and the adversary's kingdom must be torn down. We are told that will be a dreadful day. The proud will be destroyed and their children will be dashed before their eyes and there will be no pity for the infant or the suckling. I don't intend to make excuses over things I have no control of. I'm not really sorry. I'm not in the position. I am because I chose to be. We are involved in a day when the Lord has strange work to do. Okay. 
A Utah jury sentenced Dan Lafferty and his brother Ron to life imprisonment, but they were not able to refute the Lafferty brothers' assertions that the Holy Bible supported their deeds. These are just a few news stories emerging from the past decade in America. All the murders and mutilations described were performed by people who saw themselves as holy men and handmaidens of the biblical God and of Christ the Lord. They were all doing God's will, smiting devils, smiting whores and fornicators and children of fornicators. The full history of such holy murders in the West under Christianity and the influence of the biblical Old Testament would be much longer than this account and even more nauseating. The devil is the curse of those who have abandoned the goddess. Finally, a word about Satanism, which has nothing to do with witchcraft. Witchcraft, we should know by now, is the ancient European pagan religion going back to the haunting times and the the hunting times and the Paleolithic caves. Its practitioners worship a female goddess and her consort, the horned one, who is represented with the goat hooves and horns of the god Pan, meaning all, the fertility spirit of nature. Pan goes back to the shamanic figure in the Troy Ferris cave, the sorcerer dancing in animal masks and skins. This figure was interpreted by Christians as the devil, amalgamated with their concepts of the evil principle. But Pan represented life and life energy, not evil. The witches never worshipped evil, which is a Christian obsession. They worshipped as human beings worshipped at the beginning of time, the goddess, her nature, her fertility, and her cyclic life and death cosmos. Satanism is a Christian hearsay. You can't believe in a Satan unless you also believe in Christian ontology and the Bible. Satanism is of very recent origin. The first black mass conducted as a parody of the Catholic mass was performed in the late 17th century at the court of Louis the 14th. It was performed by 50 to 60 Roman Catholic priests hired by the king who conducted mass on naked girls' belly as an amatory lark to amuse the court. The satanic black mass dedicated to Antichrist and designed to worship and invoke the principle of evil does not appear in history until the 19th century. It was basically a literary invention and an amusement of decadent aristocrats and artists. And from this comes our idea of Satanism. Okay, I'm going to take a break, a break, and I'll be back. Denial of the mother, denial of the people up next. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Peace out.